Hi, I'm Professor Pratik Chowdhury, and it's, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you um, virtually, of course. And, and what I've been asked to speak about uh, at this conference or this meeting is, is about closed loops. So these are my disclosures. I've worked with a, a number of different companies who make products uh, that are related to closed loops, and I've had research support from them. So I just wanted to open up by saying, why do we need these things called closed loops? And I think just to kind of make a comment here that it's really tough to achieve target HbA1c. I know that all of you people living with diabetes, you go to clinic and it's really tough to, to get to those targets. Some of you manage it, some of you uh, try really hard and still struggle. And if we look at data from people who do manage to get those magic HbA1c numbers, they're usually doing between eight or 10 glucose measurements a day usually nowadays with a continuous glucose monitor. They're probably taking between six to eight small doses of insulin per day, taking insulin for each of their meals, 15 to 20 minutes before, and then doing a little correction between meals. Again, slightly easy if you've got an insulin pump, CSI means continuous insulin infusion, uh, which is an insulin pump. And they're making repeated adjustments. They're looking at their data, adjusting their, their doses. They're paying a lot of attention, covering their snacks with insulin, making adjustments for exercise, Usually to get that level of control, you need to be pretty good at your carb counting. And then on top of that, you need a lot of luck, a lot of skill, a lot of motivation, a huge amount of perseverance, a lot of support from healthcare professionals, but actually probably more importantly, from your social network, from the people around you. Uh, and then the importance of education to, to, uh, to surround you that. And the key thing is you need to do that every single day for the rest of your life. And so... You know, as healthcare professionals, we understand this is really tough. If we had type 1 diabetes, we'd struggle as well. And on the, on the, uh, on the side of the screen there, you can see just as you go on from the number of uh, finger pricks per day, these are slightly old data, you can see A1C drop. So the people achieving that target H1C of 7 or 8% are generally doing 6 to 10 readings per day. And that's why, you know, maintaining that level of perseverance and hard work lifelong is incredibly difficult. And what I've got here is the DPV is a German registry of uh, eight or 10,000 people with type one diabetes. The T1D exchange is a registry of 25,000 people living with type one diabetes in the US. The Swedish registry has 18,000 people with type one diabetes. And the UK NDA reports data from I think around about 200,000 people with type one diabetes. And if you look at the average HbA1c levels that you can get across those countries, it's somewhere between eight and eight and a half percent. The lower levels are levels uh, reflect people have greater access to technology. And we know in the UK, we are slightly behind access to insulin pumps, although we've now gone ahead of those countries in terms of our access to continuous monitoring. And actually that average has dropped from eight and a half. These are data from about um, from 2016, 2017. We're now at the kind of lower, uh, high sevens, low eights. It's still not at that target of 6.5% though. And so you can see in no country do people achieve that target um, uh, routinely. I also want to make a point because a lot, you know, why do we have that target and, and is even lower better? And these are data from the Swedish registry. So this is everyone in Sweden. And I just want to talk you through this slide here. If you look at the A1C and you know, whether you're talking old numbers, six, 8% or new numbers, 40, 60, 80, you can see the risk of complications. That is the risk of what these things are here is, is the need for eye treatments and the risk of retinopathy, which is the complication most closely linked to your sugar levels. And you can see there that as you stay between kind of an A1C of six and a half to seven and a half or 45 to 55, th there's very little change in risk. It's only once you cross 60, cross kind of seven and a half or eight, that, that risk starts to go up. And, and the different colors are just uh, how long people have been followed up. And you can see once you get past an HbA1c of 10%, once you get into the 80s and 90s of A1c, then that risk of needing treatment, having complications year on year starts to go dramatically high. There's also a slightly weird thing, and we don't really understand it, but you can see this a little group of people here who've got really low HbA1cs, below, kind of below 5%, if you like, or below in the 30s. And they seem to have a slightly higher risk of complications also. And we don't know whether that just reflects that group of people who've got really low ANCs, but have lots and lots of hypos, because we know that uh, hypoglycemia in itself, excess hypoglycemia, can also cause complications. And so if we come back to kind of what daily life is with type 1 diabetes, one of the major problems that clinicians and people living with diabetes have in trying, you know, that we have in supporting you and that you have yourself, is that every day is so different. So you have what we call within-day variability. So each one of these colors is your glucose level during a certain day. And you can see this individual, the, the sugar levels are varying between kind of 
four and 20 on almost every single given day. Every time you eat food, do exercise, take insulin, you have within day variability, but you also have between day variability. There's no real pattern. If you just look at the overnight, you can see these two nights here, the red night was Sunday, the gray night, the kind of grayish night was Thursday. Sugar levels are up at 15 through the night. And then other nights here, the green night and the blue night, that is Monday and Tuesday, sugar levels are right at the bottom of a target in the blue night were low for a couple of hours um, overnight. And so if you're high two days, low two days and target two days, what do you do with your background insulin? Do you increase or decrease it? And that's been a major challenge with a lot of the conventional thinking and standard way, you know, if you ask someone, if I would ask this person, well, look at your data over these last seven days and then make an adjustment, it would be very really difficult. And so the factors that affect that variability, a bit of it is about how your insulin is set up, what's the percentage of your background compared to your quick acting. A bit of it is around the variation in carb intake. If you eat 70 grams of carb one day, but then the next day you go and have a big pizza and a big meal and it's 150 grams, well, that causes some variability. There's very, we all have variation activity. You might go to the gym on two days a week or do a run one day a week, go to kickboxing one day a week. All of those things cause affect the amount of insulin you need on that particular day. And then of course, stress and illness. We've all had the little sniffles and colds coming in. Those of us little, with little kids who bring stuff in uh, with them from their nurseries, you know, that causes variation in glucose. And then how, people react to their sugars, you know, people who have maybe excessive fear of running low or maybe an excessive fear of running high. That can affect the behaviors that you do to control your blood sugars. The amount of information education you've been given by your healthcare professional team or that you've acquired from other sources and how you think about it. We still come across people who have, you know, whose information about how the insulin works and what they should do isn't, isn't up to date. And all those things contribute to that variability. Now, technology can help reduce that variability we've talked ahead about how it helps and you know i have people who've gone from finger pricking and injections then the next stage up is now using a sensor with your injections the next stage up is maybe you're on a sensor and a pump and now the next stage beyond that is something called a closed loop uh, and then maybe there's a, a layer beyond that and i'll come to that towards the end of my talk so let's see what is a closed loop i did one of these before COVID actually about 2018 or 2019. And I was talking about closed loop and then towards the end of the talk, someone put their hand up from the back end of the hall and said, you've been talking about this thing called closed loop, but what is it? Uh, and so, you know, there's people of varying experience uh, in, in, the, in the group. So just to go that, what a closed loop is, is um, think of it a bit like cruise control on a car or the thermostat in your house. So if you want to keep your blood sugars at a steady level, the first thing you need to do is measure the glucose. So you have a continuous glucose sensor, which is a small device. A lot of you will be familiar with the Libre devices. Uh, the CGMs are slightly different. You don't have to scan them to get the data. They send the data continuously to either the insulin pump or to an app or a phone, right? So they're measuring the glucose continuously and they're sending it to an algorithm, to a computer, to a control center. And that control center will say, oh, if the sugar's going up, I need to press the throttle a little bit more. I need to give a bit more insulin. And it tells an insulin pump to give more insulin. If the sugar is dropping down, maybe the individual has had done some exercise, sugars are coming down. It will say sugars, you know, the sensor will detect the low sugars. The control algorithm says, let's turn off the insulin. Let's take our foot off the accelerator. The pump stops to giving insulin. And hopefully that prevents the sugar levels dropping too low. And then when they're in steady state, right, the glucose is steady, the pump is, the algorithm is telling the pump to give a steady amount of, of insulin. So that's kind of what we mean by closed loop. So you need to have a continuous monitor, you need to have an insulin pump, and then you need to have a controller or an algorithm. So as I said, the maths behind closed loops exists, has been around for ages. People, anyone who's done an engineering degree will probably learn the core maths for this in their first year. And it's very similar to the maths that you might get in a, in a uh, cruise control in your car and so you know in a cruise control if you're going on a steady um, motorway it will keep the throttle at, a, at a, steady, a steady level but if there's a hill it will apply a little bit more throttle it will it will you know try and keep the speed st uh, steady by giving more throttle if you're going downhill it might take some throttle off to stop you going too fast so that maths is existent but the trouble is it that works really well on a smooth road like that but cruise control is slightly difficult if you've got a road like that with lots of twists and turns and traffic and, uh, uh, and events. And, and life with type 1 diabetes is probably a bit more like this than the smooth highway. It's probably the reason why 
Closed loops give their best work overnight when there's no food, very limited activity, and it's just a smooth road and they get people to target overnight. And then as people go into the day, different food, different activity, closed loops can't maintain a straight line, but they do a better job than most of us, uh, which is what we see. Now, I do say something because, you know, in a cruise control, if the modern cruise controls, if your car is going down a hill uh, and you started to speed up, they will apply the brakes. And the brakes in the human system, um, you know, stopping the incident is a bit like taking your foot off the accelerator. But brakes in, in our system, in those of us who have a working pancreas, is glucagon. And we'll talk a little bit about trying to manage the cruise control, the closed loop, with only insulin, with only the accelerator on board, without the brakes. So the technology for closed loop has progressed over the last 10 years, and I've been lucky enough to be involved in in a lot of these studies that have proved the benefit of these different technologies. So the first thing that came out, and this was probably around about 2008, was something called low glucose suspend. So what this meant was if the sensor detected that your blood sugar was low already, if you're already below three, it would then stop the insulin. And what this did was it reduced the time you spent when you were low, because now the insulin was stopped, the blood sugar could recover, but it might take an hour or so to recover or 35 minutes or from 35 minutes to an hour. So we thought of this as an airbag. It wasn't stopping you having the accident, stopping you having the hypo, but it was reducing the damage, the harm caused by the hypo. What we know is that most of the really nasty things that happen due to hypoglycemia, like unconsciousness or seizures, um, you tend to be low below 2.2 for more than two hours for that to happen. A lot of the short hypers that we see now on Lib on Freestyle Libre, they are they're unpleasant, but they're not causing major harm. The next level was something called predictive low glucose suspend. And this is a bit like auto braking. Some of you will have cars that if, if someone in front of you stops, it will automatically apply the brakes. And so what this was doing is, is if the computer, if the pump thought that you're going to be hypo in, in 45 minutes, it will turn the insulin off before that happens to try and prevent the hypo happening. And just by turning off the insulin, by putting taking your foot off the accelerator, it would stop about 75% of hypos, right? There was still some that went through and hit that low level and then it would alarm and then the person with diabetes could take the treatment uh, and move it on. But both of those were only about preventing the hypo, right? If your sugars went high, they didn't do anything. And that's where the hybrid closed loop comes in. And so I likened a bit to autopilot. I don't know, you know, you can tell from my uh, analogies, I'm quite a car guy. I drive a Tesla, or rather the Tesla drives me because I can put it onto autopilot and it can hold me steady in the lane um, without me having to do something. And it just makes my journeys much easier. And that's the point with hybrid closed loops. So just to show you, I'm gonna give you a bit of an example here. So I'm gonna walk you through these data, so don't worry. Um, but I want to kind of make a point about how closed loop helps and why it's so you know helpful and why we're trying to get this to more people. So these are four days in the same person. If you go to the top left, so that's Monday the 26th of September, right? So I've just pulled this off uh, a patient's data. Um, and you can see here the glucose range are in that green zone between this lady, this is a, a patient who's pregnant actually, between 3.5 and 7.8, staying normal. There is a tiny bit of low there and it goes up. But if you look at the bottom there, that little Manhattan of little blue lines, that's what the insulin pump is doing. So you can see as the glucose rises up, it starts to give more insulin. Then as it maybe stops rising, it turns off for a bit. Then it holds it steady as the glucose drops the lower end of the target there. It, it kind of turns off a bit. And then those dark, those kind of broad light blue lines are when the patient is eating, they're just telling the system, right, I'm having four and a, you know, 45 grams or 55 grams and that's covering the meals. And that day, the patient took 26 units of quick acting bolus insulin and the pump gave the person 22 units of background. The very next day, the person had less to eat, took 21.8 units of insulin for their food but, the, but they needed less insulin overnight. You can see from midnight till about three o'clock, the pump has hardly given any insulin. And they only needed 19 units of basil that night. And then if you look at the Thursday night, the sugar was high. Maybe they had a high fat meal. Um, maybe that insulin infusion set, the pump wasn't delivering the insulin properly. And you can see here, the pump gave, instead of that 19 unit basil here, you can see the basil is 35 units. So that day, the person needed way more insulin to control the blood sugars than 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 they need two days previously. And then you can see the very next day on Friday the 30th, they're, they're back down to 15 units. So I just wanna highlight day on day within that week, 
the amount of food insulin is pretty constant, 26, 21, 24. But the amount of background insulin that person needs, 22, 19, 15, it's so variable. Trying to do that on your own, trying to predict what it's going to be is so hard. That's where the closed loops come into their own. And that's what helps. If you can see this person, they're spending almost all their time in that green zone, apart from that Thursday night, when I think what's happened is the cannulas come out and it's not delivering the insulin. So once that was fixed, um, you can see they're back into zone for the rest of the day. And again, just another example from a different system. This is from a Medtronic system. And again, you can see um, just on that top, if you look at where it says on the top, the TDD, that's the total daily dose. On Tuesday, the 14th of December, that was 55 units. And the second day on Wednesday, the 15th, it was 45. So there's a 10 unit difference in the amount of insulin someone needs. And that's being adjusted by the system. These little pink bars there showing you the, the, the pump going on, off, you know, just applying little bits of the accelerator when it's needed. The person still needs to tell the system when they're eating. And you can see every time they eat, you can almost guess when they've eaten because that black sugar tracing line goes up and comes down. But then as the sugar drops, you can see on that top straight here, though, the pink line disappears. The pump said, ah, it's going to go down. I'm going to turn off. And you can see it just skims down there at four without dropping into hypo, comes back around that. That dark green line is, is its target, which is set at 5.5. And you can see 82% time in range, second day, 95% time in range. So these are the sort of results that you can get when the system has got your back and the, the person can just get on with doing things without having to think what's happening with their blood sugars. So at the moment in the UK, we have three systems that are currently available. There's a Medtronic system. There's an older system called 670, uh, but most people now would be going on to a newer system called 780. There is a new system on the market, uh, which is the Ipso pump. This is a really nice small pump with a touch screen on it. Um, it's still a tubed pump. Uh, and then it, it sends the data to your uh, phone. The phone has to be an Android phone at the moment. It does not work with Apple phones. And the sensor that it uses the, is a Dexcom G6 sensor. So the sensor sends the data to the phone. This has got the, the algorithm or the software has been developed in Cambridge by Professor Roman Havorka. It's called the CAM APS system or the Cambridge Artificial Pancreas System. Uh, and it's got some neat features. It's very tunable. It's the only system that you can use in kids down to one year. It's the only system that's licensed, proven, tested in pregnancy. And it's got a couple of neat features. So if people are not great at carb counting, you just tell it small, medium, large meal. Um, if the sugars are high uh, or you just, you know, you're unwell and you just need a bit more insulin, you can hit something called boost it, turbocharge the system and gets it to target quicker. But equally, if you're, if you're, if you're doing something where you just don't want to take the risk of loads, you want the system to back off a bit, you can tell it to back off for a few minutes. So maybe I was, if you're doing an important presentation, you're, you're doing some sport, you just tell it to back off and it just eases off and reduces the risk of hypo. So it's got some nice features there that I think we really like. And then the third system on the right there is a tandem control IQ. Again, it works off the Dexcom G6 sensor. The algorithm sits on the pump. And it's got a nice touchscreen pump. It's a really nice, small, slim pump that people like. Uh, and again, uh, that one's uh, been a, uh, has got a lot of data actually supporting its use. So those are the three systems that you could use. And if you want to find out more about it, what I just want to recommend is if you just go to Google and type in DTN Education, you should see this link that says DTN UK Education ABCD. And if you go there, you should see this sort of page. And if you click on educational resources for people living with diabetes, there's a section there for people just about pumps, about sensors, about all the technology that's available. But down here, you can see these are two of the most experienced educators, Sarah Hartnell and, and Geraldine Gallen, um, who know everything about these pumps and all these systems. And they walk, it's their day job to walk people through those choices. And what they've done is they've done a little video, expert opinions on each of those devices. So there's a detailed videos where they walk you through what they think the pros and cons, what they've heard back from patients. So you can go in there and have a look. And I'd really recommend if you want to know a bit more about it, then, then those are some resources that we work really hard to put together for you. And to have this benefit, so just to take you through a story of a patient I was looking after, um, you can see there May last year, they had an, eight, an estimated A1C of 8.7%, 30% of their time between 3.9 and 10. You can see their Libre Trace showing readings really high, getting really fed up really wanting to make some change so we saw them and we kind of balanced them and did some education on how they what they might do and working with us they come back here a couple of months later with 50 percent time range so that's you know you can see we've managed to counter those highs balance the instant out a bit giving the patient some advice on how to deal with different meals and that's 
that's better. That's now 7.8%, 50% time release. That's about average for the UK for someone on injections and a, a Libre. But then we put the person on a pump and they get to a pump and you can see now we've got a bit more um, adjustment. The patient is able to uh, take corrections a bit more frequently and we've added uh, We've added 10% time and range there. We've got it up to 60, but we may be having a few more lows than we really wanted. And then we put them on a closed loop and now they're up to 80% time and range and, and the system has got rid of those lows because it's certainly pump off. So just showing you over the course of kind of three or four months, how we can take someone from 30% time and range to 80% time and range. That is an estimated A1C there of 6.4%, um, a huge improvement in quality of life, you know, doing less work, but getting better results. And it's shown, so what I'm just showing you here is that this is on the left-hand side, these are data from the tandem system that I showed you. And this is about 9,450 Americans, right? And you can see there that the dark line is the average, if you like, uh, time and range they're getting. So that average is about high 70s. So that would equate to an A1C of uh, just under 50 or just under 7% across those uh, 10,000 people out to one year. And you can see as soon as you start, your A1C improves, your time and range improves, and it stays there. And on the right there, these are data from Medtronic, uh, similar system. And again, you can see there's high 70s um, up to low 80s in a couple of countries. For some reason, the Greeks and the Polish people um, have slightly better results than, than the, 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 the rest of the Europeans, but it's high 70s, which again, 70% time and range will equate to an HB A1C just under uh, 7%. Um, with very little hypoglycemia. You know, the average time in hypo, the average time below four across the country is about 5%, 5 to 6%. And on closed loop, that's less than 2%. So you're getting better glucose re readings with less, with less hypos, not with no hypos, but with far fewer hypos. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, the kind of gold standard in a lot of our work is, is doing a randomized controlled trial. So in this study, which I was involved in, we took people with an A1C of 9% and they were on injections and Libre, which is the average. And you can see we saw them frequently. We tried to adjust things, but kind of things stayed at 8.9%. We, we put them on a closed loop and they got down to 7.3. That was a 1.5% drop. Um, and you can see their time and range went from about 36% up to 70%. So the crack, uh, you know, more than half of the people are cracking that 70% time and range target that we give people. And so on the back of that, NHS England, um, funded a closed loop pilot. This was launched summer last year. And they asked us within a very short time frame, within three months to get up to a thousand people who are on type one diabetes, who are already on a pump and using Freestyle Libre, but despite those two therapies, had an A1C of above 70, so above 8.5%. We managed to get about 840 people done in the three months. And for a, for a center like mine, that means doing more than a year's activity within two months. Um, but we, we knew it was important. We managed to get things through and we've actually submitted those results to NICE, which is going to talk about this and give a result early next year. So if you look at this, the hybrid closed loop system, the kind of NICE guidance is in development. They've got a meeting coming up in November uh, and one in February when they're going to look at the results that we've submitted. And based on that, they're going to make a recommendation. And the thing about this NICE guidance is well, it's not a guidance. It's going to be a, it's something called a technology appraisal. And when NICE does a technology appraisal, that means implementing it is mandatory. So they have had some NICE guidance that came out earlier this year that said people should get CGMs. That was a guidance and local, local uh, care boards can choose not to implement that if they don't have the funds to do it. But the technology appraisal, which is what the closed loop is going to be, is going to be mandatory. So NICE will set a, a level and say, people who meet these criteria um, are going to, uh, we, the healthcare system needs to offer them closed loops. And again, just to show you in that pilot, these are just data from um, Leicester, Nottingham and Derby from about 150 people. And in those people, we see a, a A1C reduction of 16.7%. That's about 1.8% reduction in A1C. And you can see their time and range going from 35% to 65. The biggest reduction is the time spent and this, the, the kind of orangey bar is time spent above 14. So that drops dramatically. And then you can see slight reduction in time in hypoglycemia as well. We're still below 2% time in hypo. At 2%, that's about 15 minutes a day. Uh, and the patient feedback, of course, is, is, is huge. Would you recommend closed loop to others? 96% saying yes. Has it improved your quality of life? 95% saying yes.
I'm going to spend a short time talking about a couple of other things. So you may have heard of, and I don't know if there's a talk on this about some do-it-yourself closed loops. And before all these commercial systems were available, some really clever people got a something like a small Raspberry Pi. There's a small microcomputer that you can buy for under 50 quid. You get some other components, solder some bits and pieces together, connect a pump to the system, connect a CGM to the system, give it a power supply, and then you can download a program on there that will control the pump and control uh, using the data from the CGM. So now, you know, and then these things have become a bit more advanced. You can see there, there's a there's a, a box called a Riley link that can basically it translates the data between the phone and the pump. So it, so it converts a kind of a Bluetooth signal into a signal that the pump can understand. Uh, and the systems developed by, by groups called Tidepool. And broadly speaking, all of these patient science, all these systems developed by people living with diabetes, um, we're pushing the boundaries and have driven a lot of the activity that's happened in the commercial sphere. And, and so uh, if people are using these home-built closed loops, there's been a lot of concerns and a lot of people have been hiding this from their healthcare professional. Um, a lot of people are worried what will happen if they talk to their healthcare professional. A lot of uh, worry has been that you're, you know, in some of the early systems, you had to hack into your system to get the data out. I think that's less important nowadays. But Diabetes UK did publish a statement saying, well, what should you do? And, and the core of this is, you know, we think if you're using a closed loop system that you're home built, you need to have the basics of how to run the pump. You know, if you're, if you're flying on autopilot, you still want to know how to fly. Um, if the autopilot doesn't work, so you need to know when to take control. So people should still have those basic skills and knowledge about using insulin pumps and CGM on their own. Uh, you, you need to know that healthcare professionals don't know the ins and outs of these closed loop systems. They're non-commercial, they are developed and they're constantly evolving. Um, and there's a very strong community who, who checks and maintains that, but it's not got any legal power. If something goes wrong, we don't have a way to go to them and say, well, this person has come to harm because of something. We talk about not having active eye disease because if someone doesn't tell us and they go onto one of these systems and, and glucose control improves very rapidly, there is a slight risk in certain circumstances of eye uh, disease getting worse. Actually, in our pilot system, where we did take people who were running at 10 and 11% and they gave them closed loops, we were very careful We how quickly we dropped the blood glucose levels, and we haven't had any reports of retinopathy worsening, even though glucose is getting better. Uh, and then, you know, I think I'm just making a plea. If people thinking of going down this route, speak to HCP team. They should be offering them support with consumables and backup care, but keep that conversation open. Uh, I guess the challenge is, yeah, again, clinicians don't really understand them and you need to rely on support from the community. A lot of people use equipment that's out of warranty, so there's some concerns about that. Uh, and then, you know, you'll have to download the code and create the app and program. I think there's lots of adjustability and decisions to make. And, and to me, it sounds like, you know, if you've got a, a home-built car, maybe you've got the best components there and it'll be an amazing race track car. It'll be perfect, but you know how it works. Um, something that's commercial, you know, it comes with a warranty, it comes with a backup service, it comes with that spec. But, you know, it depends on who you are. And for some uh, things, the DIY thing is going to be better. For others, the, the commercial system is going to be better. Uh, and then finally, I just want to talk a bit more about uh, a couple of things. So there's a lot of talk about dual hormone closed loops. So just to explain, in our pancreas, we have two hormones. If the sugar goes up, we give our pancreas makes insulin. If it comes down, it makes glucagon. In type 1 diabetes, the glucagon is intact, but it doesn't respond. It doesn't increase in response to the low, low sugar. So it's just there in the background. Um, and with a lot of pumps, we're just delivering insulin. So it's a bit like trying to drive the car with only your accelerator and not having a brake. So a perfect artificial pancreas, you'd argue, would have both insulin and glucagon delivered. So if the sugars goes down, it would deliver glucagon. If it goes up, deliver insulin. There's another hormone that your body makes, that your pancreas makes called amylin. And there's a drug called pramlintine that is available in the US that also, if you co-secrete it, you get better control, uh, you know. And so there's been some work thinking about, well, if you want to make a truly artificial pancreas, you should be replacing both insulin and glucagon. And a company called Beta Bionics has been trying to do this for, for a long time, actually, and done a lot of research trying to get there. One of the major limitations was there wasn't really a way in which you can deliver glucagon. Glucagon comes in a powder, and if you mix it with water into a solution, that solution only lasts for six to eight hours, and then it crystallizes and stops working and blocks up the tubes. And so that was a major barrier. 
uh, and JDRF and uh, did, uh, you know, uh, NIH in America put a lot of money in to making a soluble glucagon that was stable. And now you do have a couple of options there. But just to give you an example, because now you have a break, that means that you can be much more aggressive on the throttle. And if you see what's happening here, as the person is eating, the sugar's going up, the pump is able to be more aggressive with the blue stuff, the insulin. And then as the sugar comes down, it just gives a bit of the red stuff, a bit of the glucagon to stop it dropping too fast and stabilize it in the middle zone. So now you can, you've got both the accelerator and the brake working together as you need them. And it allows you to be a bit more aggressive with where you are. It's particularly valuable for people who do a lot of sport where it, when you start doing exercise, sugar drops down and you need the glucagon to, to push the glucose up in that scenario. So uh, there is some advance. To me, there's pros and cons of both systems. I think a single hormone system just technically is much simpler. As I've shown you the data, you're getting up to 80% time and range already in most people. And so do you really need it? There are some other things that we can do, some of the tablets or drugs that you might be able to give people that might help them uh, to get something better. It's one hormone, so just there's reduced alarms, the pump is smaller, uh, and we know it's safety. As soon as you start putting two pumps, two hormones in there, that means you need two infusion sets, or that means you need two, at least two reservoirs, one for the insulin, one for the glucagon, that you need two pumps in the pump. So it makes the pump slightly heavier, slightly bulkier. Um, you know, there may be, you can have dual lumen cannulas, but that cannula is gonna be a bit bigger. And there's double the risk of site issues. And if, if the glucagon gets blocked, but the insulin doesn't, or the insulin gets blocked, the glucagon doesn't, you know, if you only have a brake or only have an accelerator, that's that's challenging challenging as well. So to me, there are there are still some challenges that need to be overridden. And the single hormone gets there all ready for most people, but maybe if you're doing a lot of activity, a lot of exercise, you're the sort of person who needs that extra um, extra boost from the glucagon and where that penalty of complexity, weight, and cost may be worth it. So just to kind of think when there may be some people out there who've had diabetes for a long time, and I've certainly looked after people or, uh, who've had diabetes for many, many years. And when they started out, they were on one injection a day and they'd go to their doctor's office every three months and pee on a strip. And that was about how much monitoring they had. In the 1980s, that's when finger prick testing came into being. And that's when the mindset changed. And we started to go four injections a day, one with each meal and a background. And we started saying, well, measure your glucose before each meal. So the workload on the person living with diabetes started to increase, but the results, the outcomes, the risk of complications got much less. Around about 2000 was when pump therapy started to become a big thing. And then maybe past 2000, we started getting continuous glucose monitoring. So on pumps, we said, oh, you know, the more times you do little corrections, the better your control is. So we started asking people to maybe take six or seven small doses a day instead of doing the two or three they're doing before. Looking at sensors, the more you look at it, we're saying we're seeing the average in the UK is looking at your sensor 12 to 14 times. So we're very aware that, you know, we're asking people to do a lot more work. Now the results over, you know, internationally have improved significantly, but it's a lot more work. And I, but I think we're at peak work now because the future is the workload dropping down. We now have got your hybrid closed loops. And actually all the person has to do now is you've got the devices on you, but it's controlling things. You just have to announce your meals or exercise, do a couple of things and the rest of the time, the system will mop up behind you. And you know, we're on that path now where the future generations are gonna get even better than that. And you might get to fully closed loops. You don't have to do calibrations. Um, maybe it, they will integrate accelerometers or activity. So you don't have to announce the activity. Maybe for some people that dual hormone system will, will provide that extra bit where you just can get on with your life and not think about things, let the machine do the work. Um, and so, you know, it's a bit about working hard versus working smart now. We're, we're asking the machine to do the smarts, taking that thinking, that concentration away from your brain and sticking it on the machine and let the machine do the work uh, and giving you time to get on with doing what, you're, what you want to do the way you want to lead your life. There are burdens, you know, you've got to wear some devices, you've got to kind of think about your carbs. There's Bluetooth connectivity issues that you have to be aware of. Um, you know, we're still asking people to, um, you know, take insulin before they eat up to 20 minutes with most insulins. So there's still some things that we need to get our heads around, but ultimately, uh, hopefully we can get to a position with this nice guidance coming through next year where it's your choice. You can either use a pump or injection in a sense and drive yourself and take those decisions. And there are some people who prefer to be in control. 
But there is also then the option of going on to close loop. That's a picture of me uh, driving home, um, letting the car do the driving and sitting back and listening to a podcast, you know, and just taking the ease and the stress off the journey. And so hopefully that's where we can get to with type 1 diabetes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Fraser Gibb. I'm a consultant in diabetes at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, and I'm going to give an update today on closed loop in Scotland and the progress that we're making. These are my disclosures. But I'd start off with a little bit of background here. Scotland is not doing particularly well when it comes to national comparisons of helping people achieve targets in type 1 diabetes. You'll see from the highlighted box that in adults between 15 and 24 years, only around 20% are achieving the glucose target that we set in Scotland. And that tends to be much higher in comparable Western countries. And the same is true whether we look at our under 15s or in our older adults as well. So there's a huge amount of work for us to do in trying to help improve these numbers. We know it's important, and I'm not going to dwell on these graphs, but from historical evidence, if we bring HP1C down by about 20 millimoles per mole or 2%, even for a short period of time, for a few years, this translates further down the line into massively reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and premature mortality. So we know that helping people achieve these glucose targets is extremely important. and It's really incumbent upon us to provide the best possible technology to help people achieve that. In Scotland at the moment, we have a fairly wide degree of variation when it comes to access to technologies. The figures on this page come from the dashboard for, from Sky Diabetes and show that pump use in children varies between 28% and 62% depending on health board. Those with a very high HbA1c varies between 3.5% and just under 24% and real-time continuous glucose monitoring use which is often a proxy for, for people being on closed loop, is variable between just under 2% up to 35%. And when we look at adults, it's a similar pattern. Pump use varies between just under 10% in some health boards to just over 20% in some. Very high HP1C, similar wide variation, and access to continuous glucose monitoring between just under 2% and just under 8%. Now, of course, around about 70% of people are using flash glucose monitoring, but when we're talking about real-time CGM, that's often, again, a proxy for people who are actually using closed loop systems in Scotland. This figure here is from data we collected in Edinburgh, and it just shows the wide variation in access to technology based on socioeconomic deprivation. So to give some context here, SIND1, the light green bar, that's the, the most deprived 20% of people, and the dark blue bar, SIND5, are the least deprived. And you can see there's more than a, a doubling in use of pumps, more than a doubling in the use of flash monitoring, and not quite the same magnitude, again, a, a big gradient when it comes to access to Daphne structured education. And that's also reflected in outcomes. You are about 40% likely to have a, a very high HB1C in the most deprived group and only about 14% in the least deprived. So we've got an awful lot of work to do in expanding access to technology, not just to the population at large, but also trying to get to areas that previously we haven't been able to reach. The evidence for closed loop technology, as I'm sure you're all aware and will have been presented at other points in this meeting, is extremely impressive and it, it really is building literally every month at the moment with papers and big journals. The current options we have available in Scotland include the 780G, the, um, the Tandem T-Slim with Control IQ closed loop and the, the Cami PSFX system which is currently available with Dana pumps but also with the Ipsomed pump um, recently. And, and time and range achieved. So a time and range target, absolutely perfect control would be anything more than 70%. And you can see with, with this 780G system uh, achieving on average more than, than 70%, 
similar outcomes with all the other systems in, in adults, 76% of CAM APS. And the brackets there are just showing what the starting HbA1c was. And I think that's, that's an important point. A lot of these studies have included people with largely pretty low HbA1c levels to begin with. And there is a big gap in the evidence base looking at those people mentioned earlier with the very highest HbA1c where our approaches so far have really not helped them to, to, to get um, their, their glucose into target. So there is a gap in the, the evidence base when it comes to people with very high, persistently high HbA1c. Lots of exciting future options. The islet single hormone, um, so-called bionic pancreas, and maybe in the next couple of years, their dual hormone closed loop, which will also contain a form of glucagon to help bring glucose up when it falls. This, I've, I've put in the future options, but actually the, the Dexcom um, link up with the VACAM APS and Ipso pump is, is available now. And shortly there will be a, a Freestyle Libre 3 link up with that. And then hopefully at some point in the early part or the middle of next year, the Omnipod 5 closed loop system, which will be initially compatible with Dexcom and hopefully laterally with Freestyle Libre 2. So just to very briefly go over some of the evidence, the only point I wanted to make with this slide here, this is looking at the, the, the pionic pancreas, the islet system, a recent paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the point I would make is the higher people starting HbA1c, so that's along the x-axis here, the more dramatic the fall in their HbA1c after starting this treatment. So if you start with an HbA1c of around about 11, you're seeing a, a 3% or, or about a 30 millimole per mole fall in HbA1c. So these are really quite dramatic effects in the people who stand to gain the most. And similarly, when it comes to low glucose, the lower your glucose to begin with, the more time spent in low range, the better the, the outcomes with this system. But of course, like a lot of things in diabetes, the, the, the patients, the people with diabetes are the real experts and the, the so-called DIY options have, have really revolutionized the life of a small number of people who have the ability to take advantage of them. And this was brilliantly demonstrated in a recent study in the New England Journal. And what we're looking at here, the top panel is children, the bottom panel is adults, and looking at the, the closed loop systems, the blue line, time and range much higher in people, particularly overnight uh, with the, the, the closed loop system, um, both in children and in adults. And I was asked to share some of the benefits of these systems, but actually I think the best thing to do is to speak to people who use them and the feedback you get is just overwhelmingly positive. These really are life-changing. I, I often say that this is not a case of adding a pump and a CGM sensor together. The effect is really a multiplier in terms of the, the, the impact these have on people's lives, but I'm not the best person to speak to about that, the people who use them are. So what do we hope to achieve? We were bolstered by the, the Scottish Health Technology Group who produced a report earlier this year um, where they were charged with having a look at the evidence base and the cost effectiveness. And their conclusion was that single hormone closed loop should be offered to people who under their current diabetes plan have suboptimal glucose control, a high risk of severe hypoglycemia, impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, or diabetes related distress in their, their daily life. And that obviously applies to a lot of people with diabetes. And the, the, the third sector charities involved in diabetes are really lining up behind this to, to try and help boost access. We performed a a survey in Scotland, and you'll see the overwhelming majority of healthcare professionals feel that a national rollout of closed loop should be a priority, that a once for Scotland approach would be optimal, that national rollout would substantially reduce the cost of diabetes care in the long term, and that it would have a significant impact on the quality of life of people who use it. And this was the, the word cloud looking at some of the the issues that the people felt may be um, a, a potential barrier and, and obviously staff and equipment costs were the, the main issues here. But led by Brian Kennan, who's the lead of the Scottish Diabetes Group, he's engaging with uh, elements in Scottish government, including something called the Accelerated National Innovation Adoption Programme. And the hope would be if they pick up closed loop as, as one of their exemplar projects, 
then that would really give us a, a once for Scotland approach, help to develop standardised pathways, reduce some of the administrative burden, um, help with national procurement, and, and also just help staff to, to upskill and really get this uh, technology to the most people in the quickest possible amount of time. Now, this isn't confirmed yet, but there's a lot of hard work going on in the background, both at a national level and at health board level, to try and improve things. Our ambitious target is to try and achieve over 70% NHS funded closed loop within a five year period, hopefully through a national approach. We want to continue to, to gather evidence to support the case for this, particularly in those underserved populations that I mentioned, and to continue to engage with the Scottish Health Technology Group. We want to, to work with individual health boards and clinical management, and we're already doing that, particularly in, in my own health board as an example, but there's a lot of enthusiasm for trying to drive this forward. And also not to forget that there will be some people who, whatever the case, don't want to use pumps and we really have to help build the, the technology and the assistance for those individuals as well. Most importantly, I would say pressure from would-be users is going to be key here. The more pressure applied, the, the more Scottish Government will listen and the quicker this will all happen. And we'll get there eventually. We want to get there as quickly as possible, but that, that is going to rely on a lot of effort from healthcare professionals and from people with diabetes who want access to these technologies. So thank you very much for your attention.